Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Alhamdulillah, hamdan kathiran, tayyiban, mubarakan fika ma yuhibbu rabbuna wa yarda. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyin Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam a tasliman kathira. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so we're going to continue our Ramadan series reading from the book, The 70 Laws of Virtue, the untold story of Prophet Yusuf. And the reason why I called it the untold story is because I personally have never read a book about the story of Yusuf with as much detail as I put into this book. Uh, so untold, meaning that there are parts of this story that most people have never heard uh, that I mentioned in the in the book. Uh, so that you are by getting, you know, these parts that that you never heard before helps you to kind of have a full picture of the story, which for you or for me, it would be untold at, as such. You know, it would be untold. So it's not that the, the story of Prophet Yusuf has never been discussed. Obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the story in the Quran, uh, but, un, you know, untold, meaning with the details that are mentioned uh, here in the book. So we covered uh, law number one, uh, which is beauty is not determined by quant by beauty is determined by quality, not quantity. Uh, we did law number two, everything you know should not be disclosed. We did law number three, protocols of dreams and nightmares. Uh, we did law number four, envy is for the blessed. That if you are blessed, then you can expect to be envied. Uh, and then we did law number five, which was shaitan is the origin of all negative energy. So we're kind of moving right along. Uh, we, I don't think that we'll finish before Ramadan. There's 70 laws and we're just in the first week of Ramadan and we've only covered five. Uh, so we can, we're pretty much guaranteed five a week, you know, which, you know, in the next four weeks, that'll only be 20. Uh, so we're, we're not going to be. But hopefully, inshallah, we can continue after Ramadan is over. Ramadan is just, you know, the starter to get us get us started. On YouTube, right? Yes, I, I did it before. Yes, uh, on YouTube, and you can. Um, I don't think I uploaded all of the videos I've though. Seen some of it. Yeah. Some. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with law number six on page thirty-eight. Law number six, page thirty-eight, and this law is titled "When People Show You Who They Are, Believe Them." This is actually a quote from Maya Angelou. Uh, and so I start with the uh, verse uh, number 64. Uh, when now they're asking Prophet Yaqub for permission um, to take Binyamin. I skip forward a little bit. They're asking Prophet Yaqub for permission to take Binyamin out to go play just as they took... Uh, they took um, Yusuf out to go play years earlier. So I, I move forward a little bit to capture the law because it's, it's pertinent in this moment. So he, Yaqub, he responds to his sons when they ask permission, should, you know, can we take Binyamin out? Because this is when they went to Egypt and they, uh, Yusuf planted the, the king's cup in their in their bags, he had to he had to find a way to get the other brother to Egypt. So he did a real sneaky thing that he was kind of forced to. It's like, you know, sometimes a little bit of a little bit of evil has to be done in order for a lot of good to be done. You know, um, it's unfortunate, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave him permission to do this, and so he stashes the cup in the, one of the guys uh, one of his brother's bags. <clears throat> He find, finds the cup in the bag, accuses them of stealing, and then tells them that, you know, um, I'll hold one of you here and the rest of you, if you have a brother, you know, that is there. And he knew the brother was there. Bring that brother to Egypt with me the next time you come and I'll give you more. I'll, I'll let the guy go and I'll give you more. So when they get back to Palestine, they ask their father, Yaqub, you know, can we bring Benjamin? to Egypt because the king wants to see him. And so now this is the conversation. So Yaqub says to the brothers, Hal amintukum ala 
should I trust you with him? Hal amintukum alayhi kama amintu ala Yusuf ala akhihi min qabl. Should I trust you with Binyamin like I trusted you with Yusuf before? Should I trust you as I trusted you before with Yusuf? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best guardian. And he is the most merciful of those who have mercy. So Prophet Ya'qub he was well aware of the jealousy, right? He was well aware of the jealousy and the envy that the brothers of Yusuf had for him. All right. Uh, the instruction that he gave to them about the instruction that he gave to Yusuf about not sharing his dream with his brothers came from a place of knowledge and not mere suspicion. Like he wasn't being suspicious. He knew that they were envious of Yusuf. So these were his children. And like any parent, he was aware of the subtleties that an outside observer would probably be oblivious to, you know, somebody who doesn't know these group of kids doesn't really know what they're thinking or why they move in the way they move. But a parent who knows their children knows they got something in for him. You know, they don't, you know, parent knows. So in addition to what he knew of their jealousy and envy for Yusuf, Yaqub did not ignore what could have been potentially dangerous for his well-being. Instead, uh, he ordered Yusuf to take his precautions. When people show you who they are, it becomes your responsibility to act accordingly. When a person has betrayed you or when a person has betrayed other people. If, as they say, if a person comes to you gossiping about someone, then they're going to gossip to others about you. If a person comes to you and they're always gossiping about people and you entertain that gossip, nine times out of ten, they're going to gossip about you to other people the same way. When a person is showing you who they are, you have to believe them. And to not, to not do so and to ignore that would be setting yourself up for failure. You know, So when people show you who they are, it becomes your responsibility to respond accordingly. Right. You can't expect that the person is going to uh, I'll do this to everybody else, but I'm not going to do it to you. Right. To give you some type of pass. Right. That they're not going to do this. So they don't gossip and backbite about everybody. But when it comes to you, no, 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 no. I'm not going to gossip about you. No, that's that's not true. If a person steals from everybody else, but he ain't going to steal from you. Nah, he's going to get you at some point. Because he's showing you by being a thief, he's showing you who he is. You guys follow me. You understand what I'm saying? Like if a, what I'm saying is that if a person is known to do X, Y, Z, even if he's your brother, biologically, your blood brother, even if he's somebody you came up out of the mud with, even if he's somebody that your A1, day one, this is a person that you feel that they would never do that to you. They will do it to you because by doing it to others, they're showing you who they are. They're showing you what they do. And to believe that they won't do it to you is your own naivete. If they fool you, boy, shame on you. Please. Right. Please you twice, shame on you. That's your own naivete. It's to believe that they're, they're going to do it to everybody else, but they're never going to do that to me. Right? It's like you, go, you play in the streets a little bit. You played in the streets for a little while. You see a guy, he's a stick-up kid. He rob everybody else, and that's your man. He ain't going to never do that to you. He may not stick a gun in your face and rob you, but he'll do some shisty stuff behind your back because he's shisty. He has already shown you that. You're just not paying attention to the signs. You think that his shistiness only affects other people and will never affect you. No, he's already shown you who he is. And what he's capable of. All right. So when people show you who they are, it becomes your responsibility to respond accordingly. To do the opposite while continuing to extend the benefit of the doubt to the person is to subject yourself to the harm, uh, to the harm of the very thing that you ignored. When the brothers asked to take Yusuf's younger brother, Benjamin, to Egypt, as instructed by Yusuf, whom they didn't recognize at the time, Prophet Yaqub responded based upon his previous knowledge of their jealousy and envy towards Yusuf. He said, shall I trust you with Benjamin as I trusted you with Yusuf before? Meaning if you didn't come back with Yusuf, what makes you think I would give another child to you 
for you not to come back with him either. You, you understand? Salam alaikum, Sheikh. Oh, he got it. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? That if the person, if they took Yusuf out and then they came back and said, oh, he died. He was eaten up by a wolf. Here's the bloody shirt. I, I, I extended that trust to you. And you violated that. You violated that. Do you think now you're going to come back and ask me for it again? It's like you loan somebody your car. Let me borrow your car. I need to run to the store. You give him the car. He goes out and gets a ticket on your car. Or goes out and gets into an accident in your car. You're going to turn around and give him the keys again? <laughs> They've already showed you what they're capable of. You can't drive or you're reckless. I'm not going to continue to subject myself to that. If a person, you've shared some information with a person. You shared some, you know, some, some pertinent information, some secret information with a person. And then lo and behold, you find out that that information was leaked to somebody else. I'm never going to tell you anything else. I'm never going to let my guard down and extend that to you because you've already shown me that you are not responsible enough, you know, with information. You're not responsible. All right. Unfortunately, some people get bit by the same animal twice. Because they think that the first bite was an accident. I'm sorry. I ain't mean it. No, you may not have meant to do it, but you, you, you definitely meant to hurt me. So, no. The answer is no. I'm not going to give you access. Right? In the Islamic tradition, the believer is described as someone who learns from the world around him. Including the mistakes that they've made in order to avoid similar pitfalls. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, travel through the earth and observe the ending or the consequences of those who came before you. We're supposed to learn from the mistakes that other people make. Why? Why? So we don't repeat the same mistakes. <laughs> travel through the earth and see what was the end, of, end result of those who were liars. See who was the end of those who were wrongdoers. All throughout the Quran, Allah is telling us, travel through the earth and learn from the mistakes of the nations that came before you. Prophet Muhammad said, لا يلتغ مؤمن في جحر مرتين The believer does not get stung in the same hole twice. Listen to this hadith. The believer does not get stung in the same hole twice. There's many lessons from this hadith. From amongst them is that you learn from your mistakes. The scholars they say, A Sa'id man wu'idha bi ghayrihi wa shaqi man wu'idha bi nafsihi that the Sa'id, the successful person, is the person who learns from other people's mistakes. So if you see you have an older brother and you see that he went down the route of drugs and alcohol. Got caught up in that. You say, all right, I see what happened to him. He lost his job. He lost his marriage, lost his pension, lost so much to drugs and alcohol. Therefore, that is a warning for me not to go down that route. Or you have an older sibling. You have an older sister, right, who went out clubbing and took off her hijab and, you know, got pregnant by a non-Muslim and, you know, brought a child, her first child brought into the world by, you know, somebody who's not Muslim. And that child is now, you know, an adult and struggling to find their path. You as a younger sister seeing that, I'm not going to follow in my sister's footsteps. I'm not going to do rush headlong into what I seen destroyed my sister. You take, you know, you take notice of what happened to others who came before you. To repeat the same mistakes that they did means that you didn't learn anything from what happened to them, which means that is it's a lack of wisdom. You are a person who is dim witted. You know what that means? Like dim wit, like you're a dim wit. A person that is dim witted, meaning that wit, meaning wisdom. Right. And if you're dim witted, meaning you lack wisdom because you saw what happened to this person. And then you think, oh, no, that's not going to happen to me. Well, what makes you so different than what happened to them? They then got the biggest, they got Pablo Escobar. They got uh, El Chapo, El Chapo. They got all, they got them all. You name them, they got them all. John Gotti, the biggest of the big, they got them all. 
Supreme Team, they got them all. What makes you so different? And now you might have a longer run than they than they did. But eventually we know that that route only leads to two exits. Prison or the grave. Those, those are the only two places that you end up when you go that lifestyle. And many of our children can see 50 people killed on this corner. 50 old heads that have been murdered on this block from 1980 to, to, to 99. 50 old heads that have been murdered on this block. And then our young kids will still say, well, it ain't going to happen to me. Dim with it. And then what happens to you? You either get slumped over by somebody, nine times out of ten, somebody that was cool with you, your boy, your day one slumped you, or you go to jail. And it's just like, you know, alhamdulillah, for some of us, it took me, it took me one time, one jail trip as an adult. Juvenile, that's a different story. Juvenile, you got a lot. You got a lot more steam in you as a juvenile. You go to juvie back and forth. As an adult, you, I, I got one run. That was it. I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson. Nah. Mm -mm. So it's 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 very important that we take this 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 information. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the believer does not get stung in the same hole twice. Meaning he learns from him, his mistakes. Also, another lesson, another jewel in this hadith is that most of the time, the pain, the lesson is in the pain. The lesson is in the pain. Because if he said the believer doesn't get stung in the same hole twice, that means if you stick your hand in a hole and you get stung or you get bit by a snake or something like that, you, you, that pain that you feel is the indication that you should never stick your hand in that hole like that again. So the lesson was in the pain. So the pain that we experience from situations, it is in that pain where you're going to find your lesson. And so for those of us who like to escape or like to avoid or evade emotional pain, physical pain, because we don't like to be in pain, then you prolong your mistakes. So the mistakes that you should have got at 20, you are now making at 30. And the mistakes that you are making now at 40, you should have got at 30. And the mistakes that you're making at 50, you should have got at 40. Because you're trying to escape the pain that is associated with mistakes. This is why I always say sit in your discomfort. Sit in the discomfort. It's hurtful. It's painful. You don't like it. That's fine. But it's in that space right there where you're going to learn all your lessons. Umar bin al-Khattab, he said, there's two people, sinfani min al-nas, la yastafidani min al-ilm. There's two people who will never learn anything from knowledge. That is al-mustahi wa mustakbir A person who is too shy and a person who is too arrogant. The arrogant person will never learn anything because he thinks he knows everything. The shy person will never learn anything because he's too afraid to make a mistake. Make the mistake. Because in making the mistakes, the pain that you feel from that mistake, the embarrassment, the frustration, right? The prolonged journey that you thought you were going to get to your, your, your destination today, but then that journey is prolonged, right? When I went to go pick up this book yesterday and I saw the mistake in the book, man, I was in pain. And I had to remind myself in that moment that there has to be a lesson in this. There has to be a lesson in this. And mistakes, here again, remind us that we're human. It doesn't matter what the advancements in technology we have access to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always makes it clear that he is the only one that is perfect. And I'm, I'm one of those cross the T's, dot the I's type of people. I'm a perfectionist by nature. I grew up under overly critical parents. So as a result of that, I am highly, highly critical of myself. And so seeing this book with that mistake, even though it's a minor mistake, it was something that I just couldn't accept. And I asked the, the printer, I was like, man, what am I going to do? I cannot sell the book like that. He was like, man, is the information, has anything happened to the information in the book? I said, no, the information is still there. He said, okay, so then the, the chapter starts at the middle of the page instead of the beginning of the page. He said, so what? He said, sell the books for a discounted price. Discount the books. 
so it's not a complete loss. Discount it and then, you know, fix the file and, and we'll redo the, the print again and you can come pick it up next week. And I no matter no matter how much those words were like duh duh like the light bulb moment, it was still the pain that I could not sit with that mistake. How many turned out like that? Two hundred. So I leave. <clears throat> Ali read the lawful end who said when he plans something to the T and it don't go according to his plan he said he know that's a loss mm -hmm. he said a loss absolutely him some kind of lesson absolutely he said every time we plan in a loss a loss the best of planners absolutely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> I'm like, man, subhanAllah, I done promised all these people to come pick their books up. And I done promised all these people that I'm going to sit in books out. Man, I'm going to look like a failure. That's what was going through my mind. That was shaitan. While I'm fasting. That was shaitan. And I had to gather myself in that moment. And I had to remind myself that you are human. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way of showing you. That no matter how many T's you cross, no matter how many I's you dot, you will never be perfect. There was always room for human error. And you have to accept that. You know. And so, um, therefore, the Muslims should always take inventory of the people and or environments that represent a potential danger to himself, his religion, or his worldly affairs. I'm going to say that again. Always take inventory of the people and the environments that you find yourself in that put, that put, that are represent a potential danger to yourself, to your religion, or to your worldly affairs. There's some people who represent a threat to you personally, to your own personal aspirations and desires. They're envious of you, they're jealous of you, and they will do everything in their power to stop you from reaching the next level in your life. Then there's some people who represent a danger to you and your religion. Some people who are just, you know, who they are and then being by you, being around you, some of that stuff starts to wear off on you and it starts to affect your religion. And then there are some people who are threats to you as it relates to your worldly affairs, where you are going in your in your dunya, whether, you know, you're becoming an entrepreneur, whether you open up a business, whether you're trying to get married, whatever it is. Whatever you are, you know, aspiring to do in the dunya, you have to be mindful of the people and the environments that are around you that will possibly sabotage. So these are three areas of your life that you should always be mindful of. Those who represent a threat to you or potential danger to you in your personal life, in your religious life, and in your worldly life. And as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-afwa wal afia dunya wal Oh Allah, I seek your forgiveness, your pardon, and I seek your safety in my deen, my dunya, and my akhira. Three areas of my life that I must guard with everything in me. My deen, my dunya, and my akhira. I'm not letting anybody interfere with any of that. If I'm going to go to the hellfire, and we seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that. If I'm going to go to hell, I'm going to go to hell because of something I did. Not something I allowed somebody else to influence me and to sabotage my chances of getting the Jannah. I'm not going to let anybody do that. If I have to taste the hellfire, it will be because of something that I neglected, I failed to do on my own. But I'm not going to go to the hellfire because I didn't give you your haq. I'm not going to go to the hellfire because I knew that you were not serious about your religion and I kept hanging around you until you influenced me to be more like you. I'm not doing that. La wallahi. If I go, if that, if that is what happens to me in the end, it's because of what my own hands have done. Not because of something that I allow somebody else to infiltrate. You know what I mean? No, I'm sorry. Sometimes we give in to preconceived notions about who we think people are or who they appear to be outwardly due to our own biases. There's a part of us that yearns to believe that because they are a brother, sister, parent, close relative, friend, or even spouse, that they would never do anything to compromise their relationship with us. 
In reality, the person has shown time and time again that they don't value their relationship with you. However, tethered to our own biases, we continue making excuses for them, all the while allowing them to continue hurting us over and over. If a person fools you once, then shame, then the shame is on them. But if they manage to fool you twice, the shame is on you. There's some of us, we are very good at making excuses for people. You ever find that? They'll find a person, they can't say nothing bad about nobody. Anytime you bring something to their attention about somebody that may be potentially harmful or damaging to them in some way, shape, form, or fashion, they always have a spin, a light spin that they put on what you're trying to bring to their attention. And it's just like, man, subhanAllah, why do you always find just this light spin that you put on everything about everybody? There's one thing to put the best construction on someone and give them the benefit of the doubt. But when a person shows you who they are, there is no room for the benefit of the doubt. You are left with nothing, no other recourse other than to call a spade a spade. To call a spade a spade. No, he didn't really mean that. No, he meant it. He meant it. Now, does that mean that you just completely sever yourself from the person? No, but now you know how to move around them. I'm not saying that we just cut people off because in that case, then we'll, you know, we'll be we'll be lonely. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is learn how to move around people. And one of the one of the ways that help you to move correctly around people is by watching what they do and listening to their words, listening to what they say. Listening to what they say. All right. And stop making excuses for something that is staring you right in your face. The brothers, they came back, they asked for Benjamin. Can we take Benjamin out to go play? And Yaqub said, am I going to give you him after y'all didn't come back with the first one? No. No, not at all. You've already shown me your hand. And ending the chapter, Maya Angelou, she said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Believe them the first time. Stop giving people more opportunities, right? More opportunities to do damage or to do harm to you. Um, I mean, so, so I mean, some some people you may have to cut off, but sometimes people are in a position in your life where you don't have the luxury to cut them off, even though you want to, even though you want to, you would love nothing more than to cut them off. But because of the position that they have in your life, whether a family member, whether mom, dad, whatever the case may be, sometimes you may have to love a person from a distance. You have to put, you know, some cushion between you and the person so that the person cannot do damage to you the way that they did the first time. But stop giving people second, third, fourth chances to prove to you that they are the same lousy, conniving, shrewd, sneaky, shysty people that they were the first time. You're giving them another opportunity to prove to you that that's who they are? A lot of times, we, we don't like to deal with reality. Mm, right? Because the lie is easier to digest than the truth. And what happens People look at things how they want them to be versus how they really are. Yep. One hundred percent. You said Shaitan gives you a window, a window, or a trigger, and you know your triggers. <clears throat> you said you learned from Abu Muslim a long time ago when you travel, travel with your family. Because you know your triggers. A lot of times to do that, you have to look at reality for what reality mm -hmm. is. And a lot of times we don't want to do that. We want to look at things how we want them to be versus how they really are. Yep. My mother get hot. My mother's a dolphin. I'm not going to call her a dolphin, but she's a dolphin. Mm -hmm. That's because I don't want to look at her like that. Right. But the reality is she's a dolphin. Right. I love her, but she's my mother and she's a dolphin. But we won't ever say that about our mother. Right. That's because we don't want to look at it. That we way. don't want to look at it that way. But right? the truth is, she's, she's an dope. addict. <laughs> she's an addict. That's a great example. That's a great example. Your, your mom might be, um, you know, an addict. And, you know, you would never call your mother an addict because that kind of diminishes her status in your eyes. 
But the reality of the matter is that she's an addict. She's a heroin addict. She's a you know dope fiend. Whatever whatever her choice of poison is, you know that's that's the reality of it. But we don't want to look at it like that. Yes. Okay. Law number seven. Law number seven. Mothers and fathers represent light and grace. So Yusuf, going back to his dream, he says, I saw 11 stars, the sun and the moon all prostrating to me. In the Islamic tradition, the father represents knowledge and wisdom, and his responsibility dictates that he guide his family along this human journey while maintaining a solemn connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what the man represents, Right. That's what the man represents in Islam. He represents the leader of his home, right? And women should know that when you no longer respect your man as the leader because he has done things to prove that he is not fit for leadership position, then at that point, you know that separation is inevitable. You cannot remain married to a man that you don't respect. And you should not marry a man that you cannot respect. You cannot stay married to a man that you don't respect. And you should never marry a man that you don't respect. You have to see him in the light of respect before you even go into the marriage with him. Before you even go into the marriage with him, there has to be something about him that you say to yourself, being with him is going to add value to my life. Being with this man is going to add value to my life, not in terms of finances, but in terms of his vision, in terms of his direction, in terms of his leadership abilities and capabilities. That has to be there from the very beginning. That's not something that you can mold him into later on, because if you mold a man into being a leader, he's not actually the leader you are because you're the one pulling the strings. So when women say, oh, you know, I molded this man, I made this man who he was, all this other stuff, right? You have you hear women say that all the time. I made this man who he was. I molded him. He wasn't ish before I married him. You know, he was this and that, and I did this for him, and I made him who he is. You are fire, boy. <laughs> right? And the sad thing about it is that you made him who he is. And you still wasn't good enough for him because he still lied. He still cheated. He still left you. You made him who he was and then he turned around and left you. So what does that say about you? You made him who he was. That man wouldn't be who he was if it wasn't for me. And now somebody else is reaping the benefit of your work. You were smart enough, right? You so, this my mother used to say, you're so smart, you stupid. You smart enough to mold this man into being what he became, and then he turned around and he left you. And married somebody else who's now reaping the benefit of the hard work you put in. I mean, just think about the psychology in that, man. That's deep. That's deep. That's deep. You're, you went wrong by marrying somebody you had to mold into somebody that was eventually going to leave you. That's where you went wrong. <laughs> That's where you went wrong, because if you would have married somebody that you respected from the very beginning, you wouldn't have had to put all that work into molding him into the man he became. He realized his value while you forfeited yours. Tell the truth and shame the devil. <laughs> Tell the truth and shame the devil. I just found out that that's a quote from Shakespeare, actually. Yeah. Absolutely. You have to respect the leadership from the very beginning. So, sisters, I'm just trying to give you some guidelines here when you are pursuing a man. If you cannot bring yourself to respect him, don't even waste your time trying to marry him. Because if you think you're going to mold him and shape him into somebody, you run the risk of you molding him into somebody who's eventually going to leave you. So you basically, many of the sisters who do this, you basically created your own monster. You created your own monster. So in the Islamic tradition, the father represents knowledge. Ilm, he brings knowledge into the home. Experience, wisdom. He represents, you know, 
His responsibility as the man of the home dictates that he guide his family along this journey while also trying to maintain his own relationship, right? His own relationship with God. So the man has, you know, twofold responsibility to guide and direct his family and then also to maintain his own relationship with God. And in many verses in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses men as the patriarchal leaders of the family unit, which signifies responsibility and subsequent accountability. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara, wa kudu hannasu wal hijara. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O you who believe, men, talking to the men, protect yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is men and stone. Idols, over which are angels who are harsh and stern. They do not disobey Allah and what he has commanded them, but does exactly what they are instructed. Ibn Abbas, he commented on this ayat. He said, protect their families from the hellfire with knowledge and good character, which is basically theory and practical application. Knowledge and good character. Knowledge is the theory Good character is the practical application of that theory. In other verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us examples of prophets and messengers who assume this role in their own families, such as Prophet Zechariah and his protection of Maryam. She devoted herself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Beitul Maqdis, which was something that was very unconventional for women during that time. However, while protected by Zechariah, as she engaged in ritual acts of devotion, Maryam was ultimately guarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the guardian, al-wali. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so her Lord accepted her with good acceptance and caused her to grow in a good manner and put her in the care of, of Zechariah. وَكَفَّلَهَا Zechariah. Every time Zechariah entered upon her in the prayer chamber, he found her with provision. And Zechariah said, O Maryam, where is this food coming from? And she said, it comes from Allah. Certainly Allah provides for whom he, those whom he will without measure. Another example uh, of this male patriarchal leadership role is that of Prophet Ismail. Right? Prophet Ismail Someone uh, with whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was well pleased because of the responsibility that he shouldered in caring for his family. He ordered them with prayer and charity, two acts of worship that are inseparable throughout the Quran. Every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions prayer, he also mentions charity. All right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and mentioned in the book Ismail. Indeed, he was true to his promise and he was a messenger and a prophet. He used to enjoin on his family prayer and zakat and, and charity and was please, pleasing to his Lord. Similarly, the mother represents style and grace. So the father represents leadership. The father represents knowledge. The father represents guidance. The father represents knowledge. All right. And the mother represents style. Many of us, we get our style, our class from our mothers. Style, when I mean style, I don't mean like how you dress. I mean how you carry yourself, that poised demeanor, right? Growing up in the early 80s, I was a, I was a student of the, the Huxtable family. <laughs> I was a student of the Huxtable family. I mean, I watched Claire Huxtable like with her grace, man, subhanAllah, the way that she just never lost her cool. It may have been one or two episodes where, you know, Denise was kind of giving her, you know, a run for her money, for her parenting. But for most of the episodes, you found that uh, Claire Huxtable maintained this demeanor, man, like demure, you know, just very poised and never losing her cool and always able to put you in your place with such class and dignity and total control of every situation. You know, and as as a foster kid growing up in a family, you know, in a family that wasn't actually my biological family, watching the Hux uh, Huxtables, it was always something that I just desired to have. I just always wished that I had that. Anybody who grew up in a dysfunctional home or, you know, a home that wasn't actually your home per se, you looked at the Cosby show and you always just just imagined having parents like that, you know, and subhanAllah, Ladeen. It was something that 
you know, we learned from, you know, from Claire Huxtable, this, this grace and style that she carried herself with. And, and in reality, that's how many black women, there were many of my friends, mothers that, that were just like that, you know, carried themselves with such grace and dignity. You know, the, 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 the dilemma of my generation, Generation X, is that many of us, because our parents were so strung out on drugs, we were either raised in foster homes or raised by grandmothers. You know, so we have a lot of those old school ways. You know, those of us that were born in the the early to mid 70s, you know, you were born in 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76. You were born in that era. You most of the time by by the early 80s, your parents were in their late teens to early 20s. That means that they were already hooked on, you know, heroin. They were already hooked on cocaine. They were already hooked on, you know, crack started coming in. 82, 83, you know, and many of our parents were gone, man. So we were being raised by our grandparents. And in being raised by our grandparents, we were taught a certain style, certain grace. Grandma, you know, she had the plastic on the on the, on the, on the, cu- on the seats, right? So when you sat on the plastic, your leg all sweaty on the plastic, right? Because you couldn't sit on the couch. So you had to sit on the plastic, right? You know, and you wasn't watching. This is back when color TVs just dropped, you know, and you had to take the, the black and white out on the porch and put the, you know, the, 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 um, the, the hanger. You had to take the hanger and stick it inside to make the antenna work. You know, you wanted to watch VH1. You wanted to watch Video Music Box. You got to turn the top dial and then turn the dial on the bottom. You know what I mean? Like, that's what it was. That's what it was. You're not going to run in and out of my house. You go out, you stay out. You know, you're not going to make this a thing of running in and out. My house ain't no barn. Remember that? So being raised by those type of grandparents with those old school ways, we learned a sense of grace that makes it very difficult for us to parent those of us who've married, you know, both of my families are millennials, you know, so... Sometimes there's a huge clash, especially when it comes to raising children, because I have a lot of old school ways. Whereas millennials, um, you know, these are kids that were, you know, born in 82, 83, 84, you know, and their parents, you know, at that time were, you know, their their parents were like the younger siblings of our generation X parents. Right. So they're like the next generation. So my, my dad was 23 when I was born. So the millennials would be like his younger brother who was 18, who didn't have children until, you know, maybe five, six, seven years later in 82, you know, which is where the millennials start. So he had his first child in, you know, 81, 82, whatever the case may be. So these are a different type of, you know, children. And so sometimes there's a lot of clash between, you know, the way they, they're a little bit more loose, a little bit more unregulated when it comes to, you know, raising children. Whereas we're more, no, don't sit there. No, don't, you know, this is for this, this is for that. You know, we're more structured in our thinking when it comes to parenting. But that grace is still there. That elegance, that grace in how we were raised. But mothers, they represent grace and style. And most importantly, maternal custodianship in that the woman takes everything given to her and transforms it into something or someone special. Anything that you give to a woman, she's going to take it and she's going to turn it into something special. Whether that is a child, she's going to take that child. She's going to make that child conscious, aware, teach them how to eat, how to walk, how to talk, right? Or you buy the woman a home and you just let her decorate it and you let her figure it all out. Anything you give to the woman, she is going to take it and she is going to make it something special. If a husband gives his wife a house, she turns it into a sanctuary for him from the world. And an educational institute for her children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed the Prophet's wives to relay to the Muslim community the wisdom and teachings of the Prophet sallallahu they experience in the privacy of their homes. I want you to pay attention to this ayah. This is why women, you guys are so important. I get it. You guys are chasing the bag. Society has duped you once again into believing that all of your time and energy should be invested in chasing the bag. So women are now chasing the bag. 
And as I said the other day, the bag, sisters, as well as brothers, the bag is not the bag of money. The bag is your soul. Your quality of life is dependent upon the quality of your soul. That's a fact. The quality of your life is contingent on the quality of your soul. Your soul will dictate what goes on on the outside of it. Much of the confusion and dysfunction that we are experiencing in the world is as a result of the, the confusion and dysfunction that we are experiencing deep down in our own souls. That's a fact. Give me any environment that is dysfunctional, that is, you know, toxic, and you can look deep into the souls, the spirits of the individuals in that environment, and you can see that there's a disconnect, clear disconnect between themselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so generous to us that he commanded the, the wives of the Prophet sallallahu to expose to the Muslim community things that went on inside of the house of the Prophet sallallahu That was a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that means that many of the things that would have normally been kept private in the life of the Prophet sallallahu it became an obligation for his wives to expose to us. Down to the way that the Prophet ﷺ was intimate. I mean, we know some really intimate details of the Prophet ﷺ's interaction with his wives. Something you will not find in any other religious text with any other prophet or messenger. We find specifics. The Prophet ﷺ, Aisha, said that when I was on my menstrual cycle, this is a woman speaking openly and candidly about her menstrual cycle, something that was unheard of even here in this country 50 years ago. You wouldn't find a woman having a conversation about a menstrual cycle in public. Much less in a culture like Arab culture, pre-Islamic Arab culture, where women did not even discuss those things in public, especially in front of men. Subhanallah al-Azim, even my, my fifth graders, we were talking about uh, uh, we were talking about Ramadan like last week and so we were mentioning the conditions of fasting and one of the conditions is that the person has to be above the age of puberty so of course we get the question Brother Shadi, what is puberty? <laughs> so now I gotta explain what puberty is and I'm using the most PG you know 13 language that I could possibly use the most I can't even say Disney because they're so explicit at this point. But I'm, I'm using the most kid-friendly language that I could possibly use to explain this. And the girls in the back of the class are like, oh, my God. We're talking about the things that break the fast. And we're talking about a woman on her menstrual cycle cannot fast while she's on. And as soon as I said menstrual cycle or monthly cycle, I, I didn't say menstrual cycle, I said monthly cycle. One of the. One of my Palestinian students, girl, she just put her head down. It's like, oh my God, Brother Shadi, please don't say that. Please don't say that again. You know, they're just shy. They don't discuss those things in public, especially not in front of men. But Aisha, she said, when I was on my menstrual cycle, the Prophet ﷺ would make me tie a, a, an izar around my waist and he would enjoy everything above the waist. Subhanallah. Can you imagine how uncomfortable that must have been for Aisha to expose that to the ummah? But it being a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that information, although she's cringing as she's relaying it, it's a benefit for the nations to come after, the Muslims that are going to come after so that we are aware of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she narrates to us her first night with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She's talking about the first night she's with her husband. And she said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had the ma'idah laid out on the floor and there was some fruit and, you know, there was milk and there was a cup of milk. And she said that she grabbed the cup of milk and she drank it. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa picked the same cup up and turned the cup trying to find out where her lip print was and then put his lips exactly where her lips was on the cup. She's relaying intimate information from their personal life to us as a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This gives us a glimpse into the power of a home when it is converted into an institute of learning and moral cultivation. 
when the house becomes an institute of learning and a space of moral cultivation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and mention what is recited in your homes of the verses of Allah, wal hikmah and the wisdom. Indeed, Allah is ever subtle and well acquainted with all, the, with all things. This was a commandment to the wives of the Prophet sallallahu that ayat was revealed to Aisha and the other eight women he was married to during that time. It put them in a very uncomfortable situation to put us in a more comfortable situation. That's what leadership is about. I will make myself uncomfortable for the short term to make sure that you all are comfortable for the long term. That's what leadership is about. So I stay up all night long reviewing, researching. My eyes hurt. My eyes are dry because I wear contacts. But my eyes are red and strained because I really need to go to sleep. But I really need to put this information together so that I can make it available for the Muslim community. And it's a short-term inconvenience on my part for a long-term benefit ta'ala, that will benefit many nations, many Muslims to come after. That's what leadership is about. Putting yourself in an uncomfortable, inconvenient situation temporarily for the long-term benefit of those who to come after you. And if you find yourself in a position where you cannot be inconvenienced, you know, even for a short time to help someone else, to, you know, make somebody else's life easier, um, then you're not fit for leadership. You're not ready to be a leader, man. That's what it means to be a leader. So even if we looked at that from a husband and wife perspective, that's what it means to be a leader. As a husband, sometimes you get your entire paycheck. Well, I remember times in my life where I used to go, I used to have this rule, right? I used to have this rule because I just, I just couldn't imagine just giving away my entire paycheck. <laughs> like that joint was painful, man. I'm in my 20s, man, where I should, I should be living my best life. Wow. You understand what I'm saying? And here I am passing away my entire wow. check from beginning to end. So I used to get so frustrated with that. I said, before I give my wife my paycheck, before I take this paycheck and go pay whatever bills I got to pay, uh, I go buy myself one thing. <laughs> if it's a pack of socks or a tie uh, so just to say I got something out of the deal. <laughs> well, like that was my model. But before I even go home, I go get me a cup of Starbucks and I go get me a pack of socks. I go to Foot Locker somewhere, go get me some. I got to get something out of the deal. Like I'm just going to hand you my whole entire check. My goodness, man. SubhanAllah. <laughs> That was hard for me to reconcile that, man. <laughs> you know, you know. So I used to have all these random things. Socks I never even wore. Right now I got socks in my drawer I never even wore because I still do that. Even though I don't give away my whole paycheck today. But, you know, most of it anyway. But I still got a few dollars left over. So I still operate with that mentality. Let me go buy me something, right? You know, subhanAllah ladin, man. But here again, as a man... You are accepting a temporary position of inconvenience to make sure that your wife and your children, you know, they have what they need. That's what makes a man a leader. Not that you get paid and you go take your whole paycheck or three fourths of your paycheck and you go spend it hanging out with your boys or whatever. And then you come home and you ain't got enough money for rent. That's not leadership. That's called hustling backwards. That's hustling backwards because you went and spent Half of your paycheck relying on the fact that, well, my wife got money sad. She got money. She can make up for it. That's, that's hustling backwards. That's not leadership. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed the wives of the Prophet ﷺ to expose what went on in their homes, right, to the rest of the ummah so that they, we could benefit from it. So the father represents light which is metaphorical for knowledge and wisdom as described by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. As Allah says, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth, meaning all knowledge, information in this world comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Imam Shafi, as I mentioned in the line of poetry before, among, it's very popular amongst the students of knowledge. He says, Shakotu ila wakir in su'a hifdi, fa arshadni ila tarak al ma'asi, fa inna ilma nurullahi wa nurullahi la yu'ta li'asi. That I complain to Wakir, Wakir ibn Jarrah, his sheikh, one of his shuyukh. I complained to Wakir about my bad memory. So he directed me to leave off sin and disobedience because he said knowledge is the light of Allah and the light of Allah is not given to those who disobey him. So knowledge is, you know, is a metaphor, metaphorical. Uh, light is metaphorical for knowledge. In Arab poetry, the moon is metaphorically used to describe the beauty of a thing. Thus, it was used in the dream of Yusuf as a reference to his aunt as his mother died shortly after giving birth to him and his father married his her sister Le Leah. All right. So when Yusuf said in a dream, right, when Yusuf said in a dream, I saw the sun and the moon and the 11 stars prostrating to me. He's talking about his father being the sun, his mother in law being the moon. And the 11 stars being his brothers. Look at the, the, how metaphorically the Quran is, man. SubhanAllah, so beautiful. So beautiful. Just how poetic that is. And so doing some research and preparing this, I'm saying to, like, how in the world, why did he say that the sun and the moon? So if the sun is the father, why is the sun referred to, why is the father referred to as the sun, the mother referred to as the moon? What is the correlation here? And then that starts to pique my, you know what I mean? Like nothing sends you delving deeply into books and reviewing and researching than the question why. Nothing opens the door for a deeper understanding or curiosity of human behavior than the question why. Why did he refer to his father as the sun and his mother-in-law as the moon? What's the correlation here? And then you go, boom, that's all you need to go off Research it, looking through book. What did this one say? What did Qurtubi say? What did Tabarani say? What did Fulan say? What did uh, Tahtani say? What did this one say? And what did that one say? And what did this one say? In the back of the book, I mentioned all of the references that I use to, well, not this book. But uh, I think in one of the lectures, I, I mentioned all of the references that I use to compile this. Every tefsir that I have on my shelf, that I have access to on my in Arabic on my phone, is every single tafsir that I read. I went through literally every tafsir that I, even some of the unpopular ones just to see what did they say about it. And then I followed the thread, okay? Tabarani, uh, uh, Qurtubi, Fulan, Ibn Kathir, they all kind of said the same thing because they were all students of one another. They all followed, you know, the same minhaj. And then, of course, what, what did this one say? What did Tahtani say? What did this one say? What did that one say? And of course, you go to your more modern day scholars. What did Imam Asadi say? What did Sheikh Bin Baz say about that ayah? Did Uthaymin have any commentary on that ayah? What did uh, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad uh, Shankiti, Muhammad Amin Shankiti, what did she, he say about this ayah? What did it... Fudan say about it and you just going and you, you try to find the commonalities between their commentary. And then you find, you know, some shad, you find some odd or, you know, unconventional, you know, commentary. And that's what piques my interest, because now that sends you down another rabbit hole of referencing because you're like, well, why did he said this? And, and they all said that. And he said this. Why did he say this? Now I need to go down. I got I to find out why, because I'm sure he said that for a reason. And I mean, it's just a never ending. It's like a, as they say, that the seeking knowledge is like a bahar. It's like a, a ocean that has no banks. You just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. There is no stopping. The more you have a thirst for knowledge, the more you will continue going. There will be, you cannot stop. There's times when my wife like, yo, put the book down, go to bed. Tomorrow is another day. And I'm like, no, I just got to find this one point. I, I'll, I'll give me 10 minutes. And it's just like, no, man, because that point is going to lead you to another point, which is going to lead you to another point. And you are never going to stop, man. SubhanAllah. As they say, Seeking knowledge is easy to get into, hard to get out of. Hard to get out of it. But in Arab poetry, 
when they want to say something is beautiful, they liken it to the moon. So if a Arab man wants to tell a, a Arab woman wants to tell a woman she's beautiful, he will say, you know, what you kill kamr, kill kamari, right? Your your face is like the moon, you know, anti kill kamr. You you are you are like the moon because that is a you know representative of of beauty. It's metaphorically used to describe the beauty of a thing. Um, thus, it was used in a dream of Prophet Yusuf as a reference to his aunt. Why his aunt and not his mother? Because Prophet Yusuf's mother died giving birth after giving birth to Binyamin, which is what the word Binyamin means. Benjamin means the son of a woman who died giving birth to him. She knew that she was not going to make it after she gave birth to him. So she named him Binyamin. Bin means son. Yamin is the woman who dies giving birth. Bin Yamin. And that was Yusuf and Bin Yamin's mother, Rachel, Rahil. And so she died a little bit after delivering uh, Bin Yamin. And so this is why Yaqub used to give them more attention than the other sons or be more sympathetic to them than the other sons because they didn't have a mother. And so while they were jealous of Prophet Yaqub, you know, in the time that he spent with Yusuf and Bin Yamin, their jealousy blinded them to, you know, obviously the, you know, the situation that warranted such a, you know, a close, you know, relationship with them. You know, and that's what jealousy does. That's what envy does. It, it blocks out all of the other logical reasons why this person is receiving such a blessing. And it just puts the focus on you and why you don't have it. That's what envy does to a person. It blinds you to, you know, the, the wisdom that is behind the situation, man. SubhanAllah. So, Yaqub, he married Rahil's sister, who was Leah. So, essentially, Yusuf and Bin Yamin's aunt became their stepmom. Yeah. That's why it's called the untold story of Prophet Yusuf. I knew, I knew his mother. I know, I know most people didn't know that. I didn't know that prior to researching this. And I think most people didn't know it. That's why it's called the untold story of Prophet Yusuf. Because there are details in here that most people didn't know. So Prophet Yaqub married Rachel's sister, Leah. And Leah basically was Yusuf and Benjamin's aunt but became their stepmother. So when Yaqub and his wife and the sons came, finally left Palestine and went to Egypt and made sujood, he said, this is the interpretation of my dream. The dream wasn't his mom, it was his stepmom. Yeah. Yusuf mentioned that he saw in a dream 11 stars, the sun and the moon, all prostrating to him. The manifestation of which was captured when his family relocated to Egypt and witnessed uh, and witnessed him transition from orphanhood to kingship. When a father and mother learn to manage their differences in order to keep the family unit intact, they become a powerful force for all who are connected to them. This is when husband and wife become a power couple. This is when husband and wife become a power couple. Husband and wife don't become a power couple because they're both high earners. They make, you know, uh, seven figures. That's, that's not what makes two people a power couple. So people look at Jay-Z and Beyonce with all due respect as a power couple because of their net worth. Right. Meanwhile, he cheating on her and she's addicted to drugs and that's a power couple. And then we'll see how that manifests with their children. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them to Islam. But nonetheless, this is what we interpret as a power couple. Because we're looking at the net worth of the two people together. And they're worth X amount of billions of dollars. Yet you, you're surrounded by an, an utter dysfunction. That, that is not a power couple. A power couple is when two people manage to pull their power together to the table and they harness that power to create an impact on everybody around them, starting with their children. The power couple is the two people that are married. When you see them together, they inspire you to stay married to your wife inspire you to stay married to your husband. That's a power couple because they have managed to harness their power, their energy collectively to begin to out outsource that power and to affect other people. 
You're around, you ever been around a couple and you see their chemistry and their energy is so uniquely yoked and you're like, man, I love marriage when I see y'all. When I see y'all together, it makes me want to stay married. When I'm around you, like, mashallah, I, I love the energy that you guys have, man. That's a power couple because their power is now affecting other people in a positive way. That's a power couple. So when a father and mother learn to manage their differences, and they're always going to be differences. We're always going to have differences. We come from two different worlds. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. We're from two totally different worlds. The way we see the world, the way we view the world is completely different. And we have to learn how to embrace those differences, not try to erase those differences. A woman is trying to get her husband to see the world more from her perspective. A man is trying to make the woman more like him and see the world from his perspective. If two people are the same, one of you is irrelevant. It's learning how to embrace our differences, not erase them. I love the fact that I'm married to a woman uh, that can see the world from the, the eyes of a woman. I get to get an inside perspective as a man who will never see the world from that perspective. As a man, I will never see the world the way that you see it as a woman. Never. I'm not programmed. It's not in my DNA. It's not in my DNA to see the world from a woman's perspective. I'm not a woman. I'm a man. I see bits and pieces of the puzzle. That's how we're wired. And then we slowly start putting the pieces together. We're a little slow on the draw. But when we get them pieces together, we can see the full picture. Women, they come in and they see the full picture. They don't see the intricate details, which is why they condemn us for our logic. We come to the table with all this logic. But if you do it like this and you do it like that, and she's looking at the whole picture because she can't see the pixels. She can't see the logic because her brain, she's a left brainer. She's a, she's a, a right brainer emotionally. Emotionally charged. She's not wired to see the, the intricate little details, right? That's why when a man says, I'll give you a prime example. Man comes home and says, hey, you remember sister so-and-so? I'm going to say, yeah, yeah, I remember her. Yeah, yeah, I ran into the sister in the store the other day and mashallah, you know, blah, 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 blah. When you tell that story to the woman, she doesn't hear all the details that you gave. All she heard was what? Sister, so you was with sister so and so. <laughs> Facts. They're not wired to see the intricate details. That's not how their brain works. They only see the whole picture that you was with this girl at the store. And let me see your phone. Did you get her number? Did she take your number? It's just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I just said I ran into the sister at the store. Yeah, but you don't know women like I know me. It's like, oh my God. I should have never even told you that I would have found out anyway. And then I would have hated you for holding information back from me. It's like, I'm damned if I do, damned if I do. You mentioned it, and it's, just a, it's for me um, that men are from Mars, women from Venus. It's an old piece. Mm -hmm. But that opened a whole new door of understanding. I'm still trying to work on it, mm -hmm. but it opened a whole new door of understanding of how Absolutely. women and men think, and I would suggest, as an old dude now, please, to find that and listen to it. Yes. If you're married or want to be yes. married, please find it and listen to it. So you got the audio book. You can get the audio book. You can get the, you can get the book. Book. I got the book sitting on my shelf. Uh, man, this is one of these books, man, that you just can't do without. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus. Right. Uh, men, we like, well, I, I just told you that I saw at the store and, you know, um, um, Abdullah was with me. You know, he can testify. You know, I wasn't, you know, so you gave her all the details that she needed to hear to be comfortable with the story. And the only thing she heard was that you ran into this sister at the store and y'all was kicking it. Mm. That's why you managed after a while to cut out those parts because you know what's going to bring up. You know what's going to come out. No, don't cut out the details because... You cut out the details, she find it from somebody else, and then you in the world of trouble. Well, why you ain't telling me that Abdullah was there? Why I had to hear it from Abdullah? It's just like, well, I said Abdullah was there. You didn't even hear that. Only thing you heard was I was at the store with the sister. I don't remember you saying that. Right. 
Absolutely. Yeah, man. <laughs> and Shaitan, he understands the power that lies in the union between man and woman. He knows the power that we can harness, which is why he works so diligently to separate us. The Prophet ﷺ gave us a clear indication of Shaitan's unyielding energy to separate man from his wife. If you are in the throes of, on the thick of your, your divorce, you are, you know, treading the path, heading towards divorce. I want you to listen to this and understand that there are other elements at play here. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Shaitan places his throne on water. Does anybody know why he does that? Everything. everything is created from water. Everything is created from water. And water is essential. I got a book for anybody who can get this right. Why did Shaitan place his throne on water? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Not you, let somebody else answer. Oh, go shoot, shoot from the three throws. Shoot from the three throws. Free throw. You got a free throw shot. That Shaitan flows through the body like blood. Okay, what's the correlation? What's the and, connection? And blood is water. Mm. So, somebody says so you can drown. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is easy to, easy to travel on? No. Shaitan is a spirit. He's of a different so different the element. Is water is considered knowledge as well. Hmm. You're you trying. I see you. You hitting the rim. You hit the backboard. It still has not fell into the net yet. Got you. Because everybody drinks water. Because everybody drinks water. Mm -mm. Mm. Water waivers. Mm -mm. Y'all not going to get this one. Mm -mm. Let me read the hadith and maybe you'll get it. it. Said, Shaitan places his throne upon water. Then he deploys his troops from the jinn. And the closest of them to him in rank are those who call who are the most skillful in creating mischief on the earth. Boom! Thank you, Sister Maida. You got it. He wants to mimic Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants to be like God. The Prophet wasallam said, Allah was when there was nothing, and his throne was on the water, over the water. So when Shaitan puts his throne on the water, he's trying to be like God. But he's too insignificant, he's too small. You're not God. He's listening to me say this right now, too. And he's probably going to be waiting with one of his tricks later on today. God, 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 I, 100%. I abhor this creature. I hate this creature with everything in me. I hate this creature. I know his trickery. I know how he moves. And I know that he'll have something waiting, you know. He'll have something waiting for me later on today. He just hates to be diminished and belittled because he wants to instill fear in human beings. He wants to be God. He wants to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You understand? Arsh is the throne. So in, a, in another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Can Allah wa lam yakun shay ma'ahu? That Allah was, existed when there was nothing else. And his throne was above the water. So here in the hadith, when the Prophet ﷺ says, Shaitan places his throne upon the water, he's trying to be like God. He's trying to mimic what God does. But you ain't God. And you don't instill the fear in us the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. Because whatever punishment or misfortune or calamity that you are responsible for is temporary. And it only happens because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you permission to let it happen. You are not the authority. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And here again, this is how you shame shaitan. You shame him by pulling his authority away from him. Giving, not allowing him to have any authority over you. Period. And even if he does manage to get it off on us here or there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafoor rahim Allah is forgiving and merciful. As long as we come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a repentant heart, not associating partners with him, you can make me fall into many, as many pitfalls as you try, as you can. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to forgive and he doesn't care. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is why Allah reinforces that 
all throughout the Quran that I am forgiving, I'm merciful, I'm forgiving, I'm merciful. The Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that if my servant comes to me with the whole of the ocean, well, Allah is giving me chills. The, if you come, my servant comes to me with the whole of the world filled with sin, not associating partners with me, I will come to him with the likeness of it in forgiveness. You understand that is to reinforce that 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 notion in our minds so that shaitan doesn't get us to drift off by making us fall into despair. See what you did? God, Allah's not going to forgive you for that. Uh, you don't went too far now. You might as well just keep going. Nah, there's no sin that we can forget that we can commit that is greater than the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Somebody says Shaitan with his little ghetto throne. <laughs> oh my God, man! Listen, we 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 poking the bear, we poking the devil. We are poking the devil. So I want you guys to understand what we're doing here. I'm I'm prepared. I I um we I done been around this corner with him before. I know exactly how this works. I know exactly how this works. There will be some misfortune waiting for me on the other end of this. That's fine. Tell the truth, shame the devil. I'm good. <laughs> but he said the greatest of the jinn, we're almost done. The greatest of the jinn are those who are the most skillful in creating mischief on the earth. One of them comes back to Shaitan and Shaitan asks him, what did you do? He said, I did such and such. To which Shaitan replies, you didn't do anything. Another comes back and Shaitan asks him, what did you do? And he said, I did not leave so-and-so until I separated him from his wife. I kept going. I kept whispering. I kept, you know, creating, inciting, you know, things between them. Oh, you going to let her talk to you like that? Oh, you going to let him cheat on you and get away with that? You going to let him do this to you? How many times he going to do that to you? You going to keep letting him get away with that? Why you keep devaluing yourself? You, can, you deserve better than this. You might as well just leave him. You might as well just go. You might as well just divorce her. Let this situation go. It's over with, man. Let's, let it go. Walk away. This is shaitan. Wallah, Allah, this is shaitan. And the moment you utter those words, your divorce. Shaitan, that jinn goes back to shaitan saying, I did it. Finally got this guy to divorce his wife. And shaitan, what does he say to this jinn? Ta'al, come here. And he hugs him. And he says, Ni'matant, you are such a blessing. You are such a blessing. Go back to the hadith. He said, the greatest of the jinn in the eyes of shaitan is the one that creates the most mischief. Then at the end of the hadith, he says, what did you do? He says, I did such and such. He said, no, you ain't did nothing. He said, what did you do? He said, I separated a man from his wife and he embraces him. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? you Make the connection. When you separate a man from his wife, you destroy the society. That's the greatest. That is the greatest mischief done on earth. Separating man from woman. I'm going to go deeper. No, I'm going to go deeper. If the greatest mischief on earth is to separate man from his wife, our government is the most corrupt government on the planet because they had instituted laws that separated man from woman, black man from woman, the welfare system. Thank you. The most evil, the most sinister, the most corrupt government on the face of the planet that is responsible for separating men from their women. Think about that. A man, if a woman was to receive government assistance, a man could not be present in the home. That's a fact. And at one time, if a woman had, if, if they would come around and check to see if she had a man living with her. They would come by and check, absolutely. We was kids that come check and see if you got appliances. Iron the iron. Yep. Didn't have a TV. Remember the washing machine? Remember the movie called Iron? And he was living with the trash. The trash man was living with him. Yeah. They come. He would take the TV high. That thing is still strong. Yeah, that's crazy. My goodness, man. My goodness. Shale team, man. And they know. They know the power 
between a man and a woman, when they are able to harness that, that power and to fortify that union, they knew exactly what they were doing. And make no mistake about it, we give man way too much credit to think that he came up with this on his own. You think a bunch of white men sat around at a table, right? We, we give in here again, we give in white men way too much credit for this. You think a bunch of white men sat around at the table and said, how can we set, how can we create the most impactful ripple effect in our society from which blacks will never recover from? Let's separate the man, black man from the woman by creating this system, a welfare system where we'll incentivize the absence of the black male in the home through welfare. You think that they came up with that on their own? Absolutely not. That was demonically infused. There was a shaitan, there was a jinn sitting in that conversation who came up with that idea and threw that out into the atmosphere. That's what shaitan does. He whispers, he suggests, he throws it out in the atmosphere and then retreats. The same way, I'll, I'll, I'll make it even more clear for you. The same way that when Quraysh decided that they were going to kill the Prophet Sallallahu We got to get rid of this man. He's upsetting the natural order of our society. He's turning our children against us. How can we get rid of this man? What was the, the thing that they decided? The offering, right? No, no, no. Uh -uh. no first it was to uh, expel him. Okay. Um, when they finally decided on the, the thing that they decided to get rid of him, what did they decide? How? Poison, poison. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. A white woman. <laughs> <laughs> he said a white woman. No. <laughs> how did they decide on how they were going to kill him? They said, let one man from each tribe, because if one person would have killed him, then they would have had to deal with Benny Hashem, his tribe. And they didn't want that problem. So they said one man from each tribe would stab him at the same time simultaneously. And that way, Benny Hashem would not be able to confront every tribe that was involved will ban against them. Who came up with the idea? Shaitan. Shaitan walked into that meeting in the form of a man and made that suggestion. Go back and read the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Go back to the movie, The Message. They captured it in The Message, the movie. Shaitan made the suggestion. He comes in, sits at the table like he's one of us. You thinking that it is so-and-so, but it's the so-and-so, in the, it's the Shaitan in the image of so-and-so. You know they can take on human form. Sit at the table, you think that you're talking to so-and-so, and he spits out something that sounds wise, sounds like it's wisdom, but it's actually a demonic suggestion. So what's what's up? Man, make no mistake about that. Shaitan has been around. Been around since the very beginning. Make, making suggestions. Once this union is disrupted... All parties involved become vulnerable and extremely susceptible to what? Shaitan's influence. When a man divorces his wife, every single individual involved in that scenario, from the husband to the wife to the children to the, the, the step relatives to the everybody involved, now becomes susceptible to the whispers of Shaitan. Shaitan gets man to divorce his wife. Man takes his stuff, leaves, go to another home, go get rent another apartment, go somewhere, leaves. Woman is distraught. Woman is upset, frustrated, crying, vulnerable to whatever whisper shaitan throws to her. The children missing their father, missing the union between the mother and the father now become susceptible. Now the son wants to be gay. The daughter is now inflicting harm on herself, taking pills, start becoming susceptible to drugs, giving herself to boys now because she don't value herself anymore. Because the one man in her life that did value her walked away from her uh, in a fit of anger, divorced his, her mother. 
So now she begins to devalue herself as a result of believing that her father no longer valued her. You see how every single person involved in that situation becomes vulnerable, susceptible to the whispers of shaitan. This is why divorce is the most hated thing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't hear what I'm saying, I'm sorry Allah has not guided you to understand. The Prophet sallallahu said, Abghadu halali illallahi at-talaq. The most hated thing that Allah made halal is divorce. He hates it, but it is permissible. Why make it permissible if he hates it? Because the human being still has to operate on the original position of freedom of choice. Because if divorce was haram, then we would be staying in marriages by default of it being haram. That's not by choice. You understand? Every decision that we will be accounted for, we will be accountable for today, is as a result of the choices that we have the power to make. Which is why in Islam, when a person's choices have been restricted, then you know that there is some allowance for them. They are excused. When there's only pork available, then you are what? To eat the pork. You're not accountable. But when you have halal and haram and you choose haram, then and only then are you accountable. So divorce is halal even though Allah hates it because it gives the, uh, the individual, the human being, the choice. Which we will still be accountable for. So all the men who have divorced their wives in a manner that was unnecessary. Unnecessary. You will be accountable for your choice. All the men who walked away from their families unnecessarily when it could have been repaired if you had just let your ego down, kept your marriage and tossed away the ego, you will be accountable. Every man that pronounced divorce on his wife unjustly because she wouldn't allow you to do what you wanted to do in the marriage, you will be accountable. For every woman who walked away from her marriage asking for a khula, asking for an annulment of her marriage because she felt like she was being oppressed because he was imposing on you to practice your religion or because you wanted to live a dunya lifestyle. You wanted to do you. You wanted to chase the bag. You wanted to be a feminist. Or he wanted to know, well, that this. <laughs> or he wanted another wife in a halal fashion. Yeah, yeah. You will be accountable. The Prophet Sallallahu said, أَيُّ مَمْ رَأَةٍ طَلَبَتْ مِنْ زَوْجِهَا الطَّلَاقِ فَلَا تُرِيحْ رَأْهِ الْجَنَّةِ Any woman who asks her husband for a divorce, بِغَيْرِ مَا بَتْس For no a legitimate reason, they will not smell the fragrance of paradise. That's a fact. Authentic hadith. Any woman who asks her husband for a divorce, without there being any legitimate reason, other than the fact that you want to chase your bag, other than the fact that you want to be a feminist, other than the fact that you want to do you, and the brother will not allow you to do that, so just grant me a khula brother because this ain't working. You will not smell the fragrance of paradise. And the Prophet ﷺ said the fragrance of paradise can be smelled from miles away. So, although divorce is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates, he made halal, he made permissible because the human being still has to have a choice. Still got to have choices. To deny you that will be forcing you to stay in a situation that maybe you don't want to stay in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want to restrict our choices. Because it's our choices that ultimately get us held accountable. Sheikh Abdulaziz ibn Baz, I'll end this chapter now because I'm going long, little long. Sheikh Abdulaziz ibn Baz, he commented on this hadith by saying that many scholars differ as to the authenticity of this, this narration. The most preferable opinion in my view is that there is no discrepancy 
and it is in fact supported by a connected chain of narrators. So Sheikh, uh, Sheikh bin Baz held that this hadith was actually authentic. However, the meaning of the hadith is that divorce should be the last resort after all avenues of reconciliation have been explored and not that it is haram impermissible. Divorce is permissible, but it is the most hated thing that is permissible under Islamic law because it represents a disconnect between man and his family. So the narration is an encouragement for one to stay married and only resort to divorce when it is absolutely necessary. The Prophet ﷺ stated that shaitan is closer to one and further from two, which means that shaitan cannot penetrate the positive energy of the collective, but he can pick us apart individually. I'll say that again. The Prophet Sallallahu said that shaitan ab'adu min al-ithnayn wa aqrabu ila wahid. That shaitan is further from two, but he's closer to one. Which means that the more and more we harness the energy of the collective, shaitan has very little impact on us as a collective. But the moment we separate, he picks us off individually one by one. What makes two people a powerful force is their ability to complement each other's strengths while at the same time support each other's individuality. You hear what I said? What makes you strong as a couple is that you support each other's strengths, you complement each other's strengths, and you support each other's individuality. I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be you. I don't want you to be like me. I want you to be like you. I support your individuality. But we have to complement one another's strengths. Where you see that I'm strong. If my strong point is my deen, then by God, help me to become stronger in my deen. Don't take away from that. That's hustling backwards. It's counterintuitive. If you see that my strength is in my practice of Islam. You married a man who loves Islam, love the deen, love the deen. That boy love the Quran. He loves Islam. Don't marry him and try to pull him away from that, making him weak in the area where he's naturally strong. You understand? And vice versa, brother, if you see that your wife is a natural go-getter, her strength is that she can organize something in her brain and she can bring it out into fruition with very little resources. She's a go-getter. She's a hustler. Don't marry her and try to take that away from her. That's her strength. Complement that strength. If you see that she's a businesswoman, business oriented, business minded, then add some deen to that. Say here, let me show you a hadith that will, because I want you to get more barakah. I want you to get more barakah in your business. And I see that some of the ways that you're doing business, it goes against our religion. So since my strength is deen, your strength is being business minded, why not me help you strengthen the areas where you're strong? So if I see that you're conducting business, but you're doing it in a way that goes against certain narrations, go against certain aspects of the deen, let me feed you some information so that you can get more barakah out of your business. Not tell you that it's haram and take it away from you. We, we're dropping the ball, man, all over the place, man. So in ending, what makes two people a powerful force is their ability to complement each other's strengths while at the same time supporting each other's individuality. This is essentially what the sun and the moon do each and every day. Boom. <laughs> Boom. That's what the sun and the moon do every day. The sun and the moon complement each other and support each other's individuality. When the sun is up, 
Wallah al-Azim, tell me, when the sun is up, even if you can see the moon, you barely see it. It's not staring you clear in your face like the sun is. It's faded because the sun is up. It's not my time to shine. But when the sun sets, what happens? The moon is clear, especially on those white nights. Beaming bright. And the moon can only beam bright because the sun ain't around. The sun went down. So when my wife is in her bag, when my wife is, you know, on her strength, going after, you know, what makes her, gives her purpose, I got to fall back. I got to be the sun. I got to be the sun that has already set it to let the moon shine. And when the, the husband is in his bag and he's doing him leading in the areas that he's strong in, the moon, you got to fade and let the sun shine. But when you're trying to outshine each other, that's when you run into problems. I end this with a quote. In the arithmetic of love, one plus one equals everything and two minus one equals nothing. One plus one equals everything. And two minus one doesn't leave you with none. One, it leaves you with nothing. Because the relationship is not about one. Relationship is about the collective. I, I hope you guys, you know, I don't know where this energy came from today. Divine inspiration, call it what you want to call it. But it's a very powerful chapter, man. Very powerful chapter. Sit back, go over this lecture again, read the chapter, contemplate, think about it. And this is why the beauty of me writing this and still alive to tell you about it is that nobody else can explain my words like me. So when a sheikh writes a book, and then you have a student of knowledge who can barely speak Arabic is sitting in front of you telling the sheikh is saying here, the sheikh is saying here. You don't even know if that's what the sheikh is really saying. He ain't here to tell you himself. So now you got to rely on some dim-witted student of knowledge to tell you what the sheikh is saying. Yeah, pretty much. SubhanAllah So the beauty of an author still being alive, because most of the time authors, they write their books, they die off, and you never hear from them again. And then somebody else is left to explain to you what they meant. I'm here, alhamdulillah, still alive, being able to what you don't what I what I don't think we and sometimes I don't think I don't I don't think I realize it is that this is uh, this is a legacy in the making. This is a legacy in the making. I don't know why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, put that burden on me, put that, you know, task on my shoulders. Nonetheless, I'm up for the task. But the book is uh, The 70 Laws of Virtue, The Untold Story of Prophet Yusuf. You can purchase the book directly from our website, www.rodaislamiccenterofdelaware.com. Rodaislamiccenterofdelaware.com. You can purchase the book. We have more copies Alhamdulillah, yesterday when I picked up the other books, I picked up uh, another hundred copies of these. So we have more in stock, inshallah. Uh, the book is 350 pages. 350 pages. I'll pin it for you here. Can you get you yourself, get it out of the back and get trunk? Yep, I got it in the back of my trunk. I'm a hustler. Hustler! <laughs> a hustler, a, a, a telltale sign he's a hustler. He got it in his trunk. <laughs> got it in his trunk. I was at Nia last night. I sat right in the lobby area. I don't know where you were. I was there. I was there from Maghrib to Tarawir. I was there. The book is twenty nine ninety nine, thirty dollars. That's the new one. The book is twenty nine ninety nine. Number one telltale sign a person is a hustler. They got it in their trunk. <laughs> I would like five copies. Allahu Akbar, and you can give four sisters, 
from this lecture a copy. Allahu Akbar. Allah. Alhamdulillah. Brother said he's going to buy five copies. He'll take one and give four to four sisters. Not these. These are not discounted. Nothing wrong with that these. One. That one, yes. So if you want to buy this one, the, the original price on this one was $25. i will discount it for $20. i am i mean, the information is there. It's just the chapter starts in the middle of the page. That's it. Somebody else on downstairs. So I'll pin, you can buy the book directly from our website. Yeah. Can he get one? Yeah, they're right here in the, they're right here in the box. I'm talking about the, the you said. Okay. You don't have one. Okay. He ain't no sister, but it's a brother. That's a <laughs> that's that's here. That's my guy right there. What you looking like that for, man? You right? Yes. Wait a minute. Yes, the discounted one is available too. I have the discounted one available too as well. Uh, so you can once you purchase the five copies, you can email me, Imam Shadid Muhammad at gmail dot com. Uh, email me your shipping address. I'll ship your one out. And for any four sisters who want those four copies, uh, based upon, I'll do it in order of the way that you email me. So I'll go in order of the email. So if you email me first, and with emails they come, they show the time, the timestamp on the email. So if ten sisters email me for a free copy, I'm going to give it to the first four. That emailed me, looking at the timestamps that the emails came in. All right? The email is imamshadeemmohammed at gmail.com. Please don't ask me to post it. My email has been out in the atmosphere for years. <laughs> imamshadeemmohammed at gmail.com. Wow. Uh, I'll, I'll be back in Delaware today, but I'm going to retreat home. I'm, I, I need some rest. So I'll be at the class tomorrow, inshallah. I'll have the books with me. Yeah, yeah, I got you. The other book is um, the book that we're reading for Ramadan. And that is Reflections for the Heart. Uh, exploring the hearts that are mentioned in the Quran and Sunnah. All right. The 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 book is as you can see. This is all that's wrong with the book. Is that instead of starting at the top of the page, uh, it shifted and it starts down like at the middle. But all of the information is there, inshallah ta'ala. So if you want to dis you want a discounted copy, these are twenty dollars, twenty bucks. Um, I have I have a few of them left. Uh, some, many people bought bought them out last night. I have I have a few left, inshallah ta'ala. So if you want to buy them, it's. Uh, but the other copies where it's not, it's not flawed, I will have those next Friday, inshallah. I will have those next Friday, inshallah. And this book is 200 and, 209, 209 pages. The sister said there's two sisters that's downstairs that don't have books. Okay. Emails. Okay, so... All right, we already got two. We got two emails already for the four books. Three. So I'll look at... No, no, I'm just going to give him one. Okay. That, that'll be from me. I don't want to shortchange the brother in his... He said four sisters. So well, we don't want to stop him from getting his baraka. Inshallah. Oh, Brothers need help too. Brothers need help too. Yeah, well, bro brothers got to dig. Brothers, I'll say it for you. Brothers got to dig. I'm crying. Stop looking for something for free. Dig. All right, so we'll um, we'll stop here. Inshallah, Taala, Jazakumullah Khairan. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala reward you all. Tomorrow we will resume with our normal uh, Ramadan series, reflections uh, for the heart. Inshallah, Taala. So next Friday I will have the um the corrected copies of the book inshallah ta'ala so for those of you who purchased the book uh uh pre-order inshallah we'll start sending those orders out uh by the end of next week inshallah all right 
I have to go. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Jazakum Allah khairan. Uh, I will do some uploading tonight, inshallah. So all of the lectures, even these lectures, I will upload them to my, um, my YouTube page. So all of these lectures will be uploaded to the YouTube page, inshallah ta'ala. All right? Jazakum Allah khairan. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyya Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa taslima kathira wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Please don't forget to continuously donate. Be generous with your sadaqah, inshallah. Also, don't forget your zakat of fitr. Zakat of fitr should be paid before the imam gets on the mimbar on the day of the Eid. Some are saying that the zakat of fitr, because of the increase in... Um, the, the the increase in food and things like that, that the zakat of fitr is roughly $13, all right? Uh, I'm still sticking with the $10 for, for us, $10 per person for every person in the household. I think $10 is enough to feed a fam to feed a person. Uh, and um, and Masjid Beit al-Nasr is also still taking donations uh, as you remember last week, we did some collecting for them last week, inshallah. So please feel free to donate, inshallah. Beitul Nasr, what is the cash app? Zakir. What's the cash app? I'll post it. Uh, anyway, I'll post it on, on my Instagram page, inshallah. So that way you guys can, uh, you guys can uh, donate, inshallah. Abdul Kareem, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, Sheikh. Hayakum Allah. Can you put it up there? It's Dalasan Beitul Nasr. Oh, Dalasan Beitul Nasr? Masjid? Masjid Beitul Nasr. Yes. Did you find out the information about the system? Uh, no. No more room. No. Can't. Can't do it. That is the uh, the 